You are tuned in to Faith City Outreach with Marina Maria, the founder of Global Gospel Worship Radio. Marina interviews local pastors and global leaders, sharing their testimonies and the work they're doing for the Lord. In Matthew 6.33, Jesus reminds us, Seek first God's kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. We hope this program will encourage you to do just that. Now here's your host, Marina Maria. Welcome to Faith City Outreach. This is Marina Maria with today's special guest, Matthew Friedman, who is a leading internationally renowned global expert on modern slavery and human trafficking. He's also an award-winning public speaker, author, filmmaker, and philanthropist. Matthew regularly advises heads of governments and intelligence agencies. As the founder and CEO of the Mekong Club, Matthew is considered the leading catalyst of the anti-slavery movement in Asia's business sector by captains of industry. In 2017, Matthew received the prestigious Asia Communicator of the Year Gold Award for giving more than 1,100 presentations to 150,000 people, including government leaders, and the Vatican on the topic of modern slavery within a five-year period in different countries. Thank you so much, Matthew, for being on Faith City Outreach, for sharing how the Lord is using you internationally as a global expert on modern slavery and human trafficking. Well, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I'm very happy to be here. I know that you just completed 42 days of your 53-day presentation tour. And so far that you, you've you done 82 events for over 9,500 people. Please share where you are traveling to and what has been the reaction from people so far? Well, we started our tour in Vancouver. We were there for a week, a week in Toronto, then Ottawa, flew down to Atlanta, up to Chattanooga, uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, Charlotte, and now we're in, uh, and then Washington, D.C. and Pittsburgh. You know, every couple of years, uh, God puts on our heart the kind of desire to kind of go into the real world and to help people to understand the issue of human trafficking and how it affects them. So uh, about six months ago, we just felt compelled to, my wife and I, Sylvia, compelled to set up this trip. Um, We get in front of churches. We get in front of other faith-based groups, high schools, universities, corporations. I spent a lot of time working with government officials. And the basic idea is to raise awareness, to help people to understand the relevance, the importance of this topic, so that they can kind of identify what they can do in their own life to be a part of the solution. Matthew, before we continue to discuss how the Lord is using you as a global expert on modern slavery and human trafficking, I am wondering if you could just share your testimony. Well, I grew up in a in a Christian home, and I went to church regularly until I was about thirteen, and then I kind of wandered off, and I and I kind of uh, didn't spend much time with my faith. I got distracted with many other things. There were some issues that were going on in my family, um, and didn't pick it up in, again until about twelve years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I had been working on addressing human trafficking, uh, and I did that without Jesus in my corner. And as you can imagine, that was a very difficult thing. I, I didn't have uh, that kind of sense of, uh, you know, uh, faith that, that basically drives people forward. But about 12 years ago, I was in Hong Kong and I just felt this desire to go into a church. I don't know what it was. I hadn't been in a church for a long time. Um, and it was more of a compulsion. It was as if somebody was pushing for me from behind through the doors into a, a church setting. Uh, Once I crossed through, um, it was so much different from my own church experience because as uh, um, uh, I went to a Church of Christ congregational church, it was was very traditional and it was a lot of pomp and circumstance. The church that I went to in Hong Kong was charismatic and there was a lot of praying and there was a lot of energy and there was a rock band playing Christian fellowship music. I I hadn't seen anything like that. After that, uh, I was hooked. I I started going to church. kind of every week. I eventually kind of spent a lot of time to identify some some blockages that I had had that needed to be fixed. And as a result of that process, uh, 
Um, eventually, my wife and I uh, were asked to set up a ministry in the church related to human trafficking. And as this journey continued, I just kept getting deeper and deeper in my faith. Uh, I felt like my my prayers were being answered. And I, for the first time, felt a sense of calm and peace associated with the work that I was doing. Prior to that, it was it was always... Uh, uh, very uh, aggressive in terms of the, the the enemy's attacks on me and so mm. forth. And so I, I the prayer just has changed everything for me. Amen. I bet. How did you become an expert on modern slavery and human trafficking? Did you read books? Did you take classes? Actually, it, it happened as a result of something that occurred 30 years ago. I was living and working in Nepal. I was a public health officer for the U.S. government, and at that time. I had the HIV AIDS portfolio. And what we were finding were girls 12, 13 years old who were HIV positive, couldn't understand what was going on. So we went to the shelters to interview them. We often heard the same story over and over again. And it went something like this. Human trafficker, a guy around 20 years old, would go into a remote village, flash a bunch of money around, and say he's looking for a wife. He'd say, I don't want an urban wife, I want a village wife. He'd find a girl 12, 13 years old, befriend her, and then go to the family and say, I'd like to marry your daughter. And that part of the world is quite common. So they would agree, thinking, wow, he's going to take care of our daughter, going to take care of us. Everybody's happy. Two days later, they have a wedding ceremony. After he goes to the family and says, I'm going to take your daughter to the capital, Kathmandu, but don't worry, I'll be back in three months. But that's not what's going to happen. Instead of taking her to the capital, he takes her to Mumbai, India, to the red light district where the brothels are. He puts her in a room and he says, honey, stay here. I'll be back in a few minutes. As she was coming into this situation, it's all these women dressed funny, these men there. She says, no, 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 I'm scared. Don't leave me here. He then leaves to go to, he says, it's okay, I'll be right back. He then leaves to go to uh, the madam to get the $500 for having sold her to the brothel. He has the gold from the wedding and he hands the wedding pictures over. He then leaves to go back to Nepal to do this again and again, 40, 50 times a year. The madam then goes into the room where the girl is and says, guess what? Your husband just sold you to me. And you're going to be with 20 guys a day every day. You can imagine her shock. No, no, no. My husband loves me. No, that's what happens. When these girls internalize this, many of them say, I'll kill myself before I do those shameful things. The madam then brings out the wedding photo and says, this is your mom, your dad, and your brother. If you hurt yourself, we'll hurt them. So she's trapped in this situation. In order to make her into a prostitute, they bring in people and they'll uh, serially rape her over and over again until eventually just accepts what happens to her, and then she's put on the line, which means that she'll be with 20 guys a day, every day, for two or three years, until what uh, she what happens to many of these girls is they get what's called black eye, where she's so depleted physically, emotionally, and spiritually that nobody wants her, so they throw her out into the street. So I was hearing this over and over again, but I didn't understand the evil of it until I went to those brothels. I was invited by the Indian government to do public health checks. I had a police officer with me went into one of the brothels and there was an 11 year old trafficking victim. This girl saw this Caucasian guy, saw this opportunity, literally ran up and wrapped herself around me and said, save me, save me. They're doing terrible things to me. I looked down at this child who was hysterically crying. I turned to the police officer and said, we need to get her out of here. He said, we can't do that. What are you talking about? You're a cop. He says, if we try to leave, we'll both be killed. To make a long story short, we left, we came back with a lot more police, but of course she was gone. Now, I tell this story because I wasn't one of those 15-year-olds that said, when I grow up, I want to be an activist. In fact, I did everything I could not to be one. But every once in a while, God tests us. This was my test. I was supposed to get that girl out. I failed miserably. After that, I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep. And I did what a lot of kind of activists do. I surrendered to the fact that now that I've been exposed to this, this is what I'm going to do with my life. And 30 years later, here we are having this conversation. After that, I just immersed myself in the work, learned about what I needed to do. And for the last 32 years, I've been working on addressing this topic all over the world. Do people worldwide know that modern day slavery and human trafficking exists? Um, you know, it's quite interesting. It's a good question. Um, in Asia, there seems to be a lot more awareness because we're much closer to the action. But when I do tours across Canada in the United States and tell them that there are modern slaves in both of those countries, they're often shocked because they think that this is something that happens far away. In the United States, the estimates is about 400,000 people in modern slavery. In Canada, it's about 25,000. 
because we have forced prostitution. We have people who are forced to uh, pick uh, tomatoes and uh, oranges and various other things and other people who are in similar type situations. Uh, when it comes to general awareness in North America, it's quite low. And again, people think that this is something that has no relevance to them. And as a result of that, that's why there's not much uh, awareness related to this particular topic. What is the difference between the two, modern day slavery and human trafficking? So human trafficking was the terminology that was developed 30 years ago. Most of the cases we saw had a person going from one country to another. And so the idea of a person being taken from one location to another or trafficked or moved was considered to be relevant and important like drug trafficking, you take the drugs, move them across the border and then sell them or arms trafficking. But gradually over time, people said, well, wait a minute, we see cases of a person going from one country to another or from one province to another province within a country or from one side of a city to another, shouldn't we focus on the exploitation? And so when they were looking for uh, an alternative uh, terminology, for a person who doesn't get paid, can't leave a situation, there's violence, there's threat, there's all kinds of other things going on, the word slavery kept coming up. But when people think about slavery, they think about something that happened a long time ago. Mm -hmm. So they put the word modern next to it. Mm -hmm. So human trafficking is the process by which a person enters into an endpoint, which is now called modern slavery. Now, most of the world continues to use modern slavery as the new terminology. In the United States, you don't see it as much. And that's partly because there's no legal definition for modern slavery. There is for human trafficking, but not for modern slavery. But I think gradually over time, you'll see that transition take place. In what countries and states does modern day slavery and human trafficking exist? Or would you say it, it exists everywhere? Well, it, it exists everywhere. Um, the uh, estimate as of two weeks ago was 40 million people around the world in modern slavery. It went up another 10 million post-COVID. And these statistics come from the United Nations. That means about 9.2 million people enter per year in a single day, 25,200 people. In the time it takes us to do this two-part series, about 1,000 people or new slave every four seconds. As I mentioned, in the United States, the number is um, about 400,000 people in modern slavery. Um, but all over the world, you find it within um, uh, developed countries, developing countries. Uh, there's no country that I've worked in, and I've worked in 43, that hasn't had a, a large percentage of people in this situation that we call modern slavery. I know you just um, gave some numbers. So are you saying that there's more modern day slavery and human trafficking in the U.S. or in third world countries? Well, I mean, India has 18 million. Uh, China would have about 4 million. The United States estimate is 400,000. But I think that number is an underestimate because by definition, anyone under the age of 18 who's in prostitution would be perceived and identified as being a human trafficking victim. And there's many, many young girls who are tricked and deceived and forced into prostitution at very young ages in the United States. Add to that all of the kind of migrants to get across the border that, uh, you know, are under the radar. And so they're easily exploitable. And so you find large numbers of people in the United States. So the draw for um, kind of many people who become trafficking victims is a better life. And when they go from a less developed country to a developed country uh, and they do it uh, uh, in an illegal way, it leads to the vulnerability of traffickers taking advantage of that situation. So why does it exist? Um, a couple of things. Uh, greed, you know, people recognizing that they can get more money by not paying people. Um, a second thing is uh, um, you hear the phrase crime doesn't pay. Well, it actually does pay. When it comes to human trafficking, uh, last year, uh, out of 40 million people, only 108,000 of them were, uh, were rescued. And out of half a million criminals, less than 6,000 people were committed. That means that 0.2% of the victims were rescued and 0.8% of the criminals were put in jail. The reason why they can get away with this is the profits generated from modern slavery, 150 billion US dollars a year. The amount of money that's available with all of the non-government organizations, the church groups, the United Nations, the governments is about 350 million or 0.23 percent. 
of the profits. So the profits are huge. The amount of money to fight it is very, very small. And we're not even reaching a half percent. And so when I say these um, kind of figures, it just, it just breaks my heart. You know, I've been working on this for over 32 years and we're still, you know, just not having much of an impact with something that we're dealing with that is just, just so horrific. And it's just such a terrible thing for the women and the girls and forced prostitution or the men and the boys and the rest of the people who are in forced labor. It's just an awful, awful scenario. We should be doing much better than that. So when you say we need to do more and we need to be doing something much better than what we're doing now, what does that look like? Well, I mean, there's about 20,000 people like me who do this full time against a half million greed incentivized criminals. We have to follow rules and regulations and get donor approvals and everything else. They don't. They they just mutate and change it or kill somebody or do whatever it is that they need to do in order to protect things. Um, if we were to double or triple or quadruple the amount of money, we're still at probably less than two or three percent of the victims. What we need to do is to get people to be aware of this topic, for them to understand that we're dealing with a slavery that's different from 150 years ago, but similar in terms of the pain and suffering that people go through. And so the reason why my wife and I are doing this study tour or this presentation tour is to just get in front of as many people as we can to help them to understand the issue and what they need to do and to encourage people to uh, be a part of the solution. And what often happens when I do a presentation, let's say I have 100 people in a room, I say to the audience, how many of you knew 10% of what I was talking about before I said it? And I usually don't get more than one or two hands. If people don't know about an issue, they're not going to care. If they don't care. They're not going to do anything. So awareness raising is an essential part of kind of getting a critical mass of people who will eventually say enough is enough. You know, God doesn't want this to be happening in the world. We just have to find a way of just getting more and more people to accept some responsibility for addressing this and to put some pressure on, you know, governments and uh you know, the United Nations and other organizations to say this needs to be a priority because what we're dealing with here is really, really horrific. This is Marina Maria from Faith City Outreach with today's special guest, Matthew Friedman, who is a leading internationally renowned global expert on modern slavery and human trafficking. We are talking about how the Lord is using him internationally as a global expert on modern slavery and human trafficking and what people can do to prevent it from increasing in our world. Matthew, you did give a scenario on a certain trafficker, um, how he caught his victim. Is that the typical scenario of how traffickers operate? Um, for sex trafficking, what we often see is uh, the pimps and the madams will um, prey on people who are broken, people who are from dysfunctional families, families where there's uh, sexual abuse or physical abuse or emotional abuse. And so what happens is you often have a young girl, she has a fight with her parents, she runs away for a period of time, she gets into a, a, a city uh, planning to go back, but she realizes that she doesn't have the money to, to go back immediately and the pimps see this. And so they're drawn to these people. And so what they'll do is shower this young person with love and affection for a period of time to give an alternative to what her usual life is. But then eventually what happens is there's a transition to this individual saying, okay, well, if you love me, and look at what I've done everything for you, then you will go and you will raise money because I'm in trouble because I have indebtedness or something else. And so then the, the, the pimp will turn on her. But this grooming process that takes place is very almost scientific in terms of understanding the psychology of brokenness. And as a result of that, a lot of people get tricked into it. We're seeing a lot of that happening online now as well where you see um, kind of a person who is maybe misunderstood. She's in a chat room and you'll have somebody posing to be a 17 year old boy when in fact he's a 55 year old man who has six laptops opened up and he's grooming several people simultaneously. And the idea is to eventually get that girl to meet in a particular location. Maybe he um, uses an avatar, a, a 17 year old boy who's working with him. Uh, they'll go on a date uh, and then he slips her some type of a drug so that uh, three hours later they wake up in a hotel room and she's naked and they take compromising photos and then they use that to leverage things. 
we, we see this type of thing happen on a regular basis. And it's just one of those things that we really need to educate our kids about, you know, and help them to understand that you never know who's on the other end of a, of a chat line or a Zoom or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, you just can't tell. And as a result of that, it's really important not, not to enter into a relationship with somebody. What are a couple of warning signs that people or parents should watch for to protect themselves against traffickers and to protect their children too? You know, it's interesting on this trip, I must have had seven or eight mothers come up to me and they said, you know, when I was in that train station, I saw this situation where this guy was with a girl that didn't seem right, or I was at the supermarket, mm -hmm. or I was in the park, and, and the radar went up, but I didn't really know what to do. I didn't, I didn't have an answer to, to, you know, do I call the police? How do, I, how do I do it quickly? And so forth. And so even years later, they're thinking about this. As human beings, there's kind of a radar when you see a group of uh, us people together. If you see a, a guy with a young girl and maybe she's dressed uh, uh, inappropriately for the season or she doesn't look like she has any kind of a relationship or she diverts her eyes or she seems nervous or scared, these are the telltale signs that you, you often can tell that something inappropriate or potentially inappropriate is happening. And so... You know, there are certain hotlines that you can use. I'll just give you the number that is uh, is here in the United States. It's 1-888-373-7888. Now, if you call this hotline, it's run by an organization called Polaris. They're going to take the information down. They're going to uh, contact law enforcement. They're going to follow up with whatever it is that needs to be done. It's a very effective group. I've worked with them on and off for many years. Um, this is the kind of thing that's needed. If you don't remember that number, call 911 and just say, listen, you know, I see this thing. We're in a park. It seems inappropriate. Um, I've often had cases like that where somebody reports it turn into a successful rescue. And so we as human beings have to recognize that Maybe that's the only time that young person is going to have somebody see this mm -hmm. and react to it. So we have to be part of the solution by knowing what to look for. And then if we see something, uh, having the courage to go and call and, and see if you can, you can address this type of thing. Have the laws against human trafficking gotten more uh, stricter over the years or are they the same? In many cases, they're the same. It's like in Georgia, for example, they keep passing uh, kind of progressive laws related to um, sex trafficking and how to prevent it. But there's a lot of other places that still will arrest a 14-year-old streetwalker. Now, mm -hmm. by definition, if you're under the age of 18 and you are in prostitution, you are a sex trafficking victim. Whether you say you want to be doing this or not, and a lot of girls do because they're brainwashed into thinking that that's what they want to do. But by arresting them and putting them in jail and giving them a record, it's very difficult for them to get out. For me, the, the best thing that could happen in the United States is for us to identify the locations that haven't caught up to that and to give them the training and the expertise and the um, kind of resources to be able to ensure that anyone under the age of 18 who is uh, identified as a prostitute goes to a shelter. It's the, the prayer, the love, the compassion, whatever it is that that person needs in order to kind of move on with their life. And that to me would be the biggest change that I'd like to see happening related to laws in, in the United States. The tr you mentioned training and the expertise and also the resources. How long would a training take in order to train somebody? Well, I mean, I, I basically will do a standard presentation that's about 50 minutes. And in that, you will get a framework for your mind for understanding what is human trafficking? How does it work? How many people are involved? You know, what uh, are the various response groups doing or not doing? What's needed? And what you can do as a, as a human being to just step up and be part of the solution. So it doesn't take long to have that. But generally what happens is, we get bits and pieces of what human trafficking is with a news story, or we see it in the newspaper, but not enough to create that template. It's extremely important for teachers and students and the general public uh, to have that general sense of what we're talking about with human trafficking. Once you do, it makes it easier for that information that's coming in to be kind of uh, coordinated in your mind 
and then it helps you to be able to then figure out what your potential uh, response or involvement in the response could be. That's great. Um, I hope that we can continue this conversation in the next, um, in part two, where you will be sharing the template for teachers and people, you know, right before they get out the door from their house. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you so much for being on Face City Outreach, and we will continue this on your um, return again. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You've been listening to Global Gospel Worship Radio with Marina Maria. We'd like to thank our financial sponsors for supporting this internet global radio ministry. Carvajal & Associates Health Insurance Brokers, PLC. Scripture Picture and AZ Ministry Network. We'd also like to thank our prayer partners, including Venture Church, the Spheres of Influence, the Center for Peace and Reconciliation, Repentance Day, and now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face toward you and give you peace. Thanks for listening.